We're done. Good afternoon to all of those of you who are in Zadar and uh, very early good morning from here in Los Angeles. Um, and welcome to the third session of this conference, which is titled Cultural Heritage in Digital Humanities. I'm Anne Gilliland, um, Professor of Archival Studies in the Department of Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, we have three presentations today, and in the interest of time, I'm only going to give the briefest of introductions of the speakers before they give their presentations, since fuller biographies are provided for you um, through the conference. Um, we're going to um, pause after each presentation to take one or two questions, if there are any. And if we do have any time at the end of the session, we can open it up for further questions and discussion. So our first speaker today is Ershiba Tusithra. She is the Open Science Officer of Daria EU, where she's responsible for fostering and implementing policies and practices related to the open dissemination of research results in the humanities. Her presentation is titled, Where Open Data Starts with a Handshake, the Heritage Data Reuse Charter. So I'll turn it over to Ershiba. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Also, uh, the virtual attendees. Nice. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, like uh, uh, Thanks for having me today. Um, I cannot tell you how extremely grateful I am for having this opportunity after uh, one and a half years of home officing online conferencing, even if uh, I cannot use my second screen as a cheat sheet this time. <laughs> Hopefully this will suffice. So uh, wait, it says I need to unmute myself. Should I? No, need no, 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 no. <laughs> then I'm gonna just ignore this. Okay, good. And I also try to turn pages in my presentation. Good. So um, if you attended the morning session, uh, you might you may be acquainted to Daria already through Jennifer's amazing presentation. And as Jennifer mentioned, um, at ARIA, uh, part of our mission is to build bridges between uh, the high level vision of open science and the research realities in the arts and humanities disciplines. So when it comes to things like uh, elements like uh, the Tia Dranka mentioned before, like when it comes to open access, when it comes to open data, when it comes to fair data, one question that uh, we usually ask from ourselves is whether we can talk about shared problems, shared challenges at all, and such a diverse range of disciplines that are accommodated under this umbrella terms of arts, a term of arts and humanities. And clearly one of these shared challenges that affects working conditions in many arts and humanities research setting is access to the resources that are maintained and curated in galleries, archives, museums, and libraries. So I think to you sitting in a room, to you attending this conference virtually or face-to-face, -face, it's pretty clear how much digitized or born digital culture heritage resources are actually preconditions, serious preconditions of uh, uh, arts and humanities research. And this kind of resources are delicate matter, not only in terms of their materiality, as my slide probably suggests, maybe I shouldn't look back, uh, <laughs> because it will not look nice in the recording brackets close, but also in terms of um, legal, uh, ethical, and technical issues. So what we see is that in many cases, there is we see a lack of um, clear and comprehensive framework that would serve, that would guide the interactions between cultural heritage uh, institutions and arts and humanities scholars. This is an issue that we also discussed briefly uh, in a morning session by the wonderful presentations. And um, so researchers want, who, who want to reuse cultural heritage data, they need to know things like who are the rights holders, what are the legal rights in the data? 
how those rights can be translated to everyday research scenarios. What can I do with this um, record under this license? Can I photograph it? Can I text and data mine it? Can I include it in my publication? So the lack of the degree of unclarity and confusion around these issues is a recurrent problem. I think all actors in around these exchanges are suffering from. So um, to give you an idea about the kinds of catastrophes that could happen when uh, this uh, unclarities persist, we need to travel back to February 2017 at the time of finalizing uh, the publication of archival uh, research guides uh, made uh, within the Euro framework of the European project Sendari. And so scholars working with uh, first world war materials found themselves in a situation in which um, the legal status of the, these illustrative images turned out to be so unclear even after repeated checks even after repeated like rounds of rounds of rounds of research that eventually they have to leave them out of the publication so i think that this illustrates very clearly probably the worst thing that could happen to our cultural heritage that due to this legal technical ethical unclarities um, certain topics certain communities certain uh, fragments of our cultural heritage remain uh, invisible from uh, scholarly or cultural discourse. Um, but let's not be only pessimistic. I also want to show you a bit of a magic that can happen when the different actors collaborate uh, with each other in a smooth manner. So what you can see here is um, a project uh, winner of a European uh, research award. Um, it must be familiar to some of you. Um, this is an interactive uh, visualization built on top of the European 1914-1918 uh, um, uh, archives metadata. And I think it shows quite um, clearly what, like not only the possible narratives around how postcards traveled uh, during the uh, First World War, but also it shows clearly how we can change research conditions, how we can interact with our heritage in completely new ways, how we can um, ask completely new kinds of questions from history if these actors are working together and all these legal, ethical, technical complexities are sorted out. So I think from these two contrasting examples, contrasting examples coming from the same investigation of the same period, what should be clear is that um, with arts and humanities research workflows, data curation happens on a long and cross-sector continuum where uh, it starts with the cultural heritage institutions who take care of selecting, hosting, curating the artifacts, rights management and the like. Sometimes we also have uh, digital humanities labs or research facilities who make digitized resources um, available for large scale computational analysis. So they sometimes they join this continuum too. Then of course come the researcher who do the analysis, do the enrichments on top of the primary resources. And I think we shouldn't forget, forget about um, research infrastructures and publishers who archive and maintain for long term all uh, the scholarly outputs that scholars produce uh, uh, as kind of enrichments to these uh, primary resources. So we mentioned fair data before uh, in the morning sessions. Uh, we believe that in the arts and humanities, Fair data really starts with this. Starts uh, with with research scenarios where nothing disastrous happens in this long continuum. But I think we also all know that the reason why it's super difficult to achieve, the reason why primary resources and their enrichments in the rarest case can stay connected to each other is because uh, all these actors who form a natural continuum in data curation are separated in different institutional, legal, 
geographical and also funding silos. It's important to highlight. So uh, these are operating situated deeply in very different conditions. Uh, and this is a major challenge when it comes to uh, sustainable, fair, open uh, data workflows in the arts and humanities. Um, so, um, to, like um, in recognition to this to this major challenge, um, major representatives and stakeholders. I don't like this word state stakeholder. Let's say major players around cultural heritage and arts and humanities data on the European level. Like you can see them here: Archive, Ar Archives Portal Europe, Europeana. Uh, Clarin and the like came together and joined forces under the governance of Daria to tackle these issues and um, facilitate access to, 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 to cultural heritage data. And you can see here the big vision that we had in mind back then a couple of years ago, uh, what we call the, the cultural heritage reuse charter, uh, which would be a common environment that would enable all these different actors to work together to establish principles, principles, but also on a practical level mechanisms to um, sort out all these complexities and de-silo these workflows. So um, the very first step um, in this direction was um, these players sit together and um, agreed on the six core principles around which that could serve as a framework um, that should really be present and, and govern the interactions between cultural heritage institutions, researchers, and when involved uh, like uh, digital humanities labs as well. These principles are reciprocity in the sense of um, this data work partnership should be really present in these workflows. So it shouldn't be a single directional exchange like researchers take what they want from cultural institutions. There should be a partnership and a mutual recognition of each other's work, each other's effort. Um, the second one is interoperability in the sense of uh, cultural heritage resources should be made available in formats that are suitable for uh, arts and humanities research, including also digital computational research methods. So if you know the collections as data initiative, um, interoperability mm -hmm. covers pretty much that uh, aim. Uh, we know it's a very big one, very ambitious one. Um, <laughs> citability uh, has to do with persistent um, and easy citations, not only for the primary resources, but also um, the scholarly outputs that result from them. Um, trustworthiness um, has to do with um, long-term access and accessibility and long-term archiving, and like um, having uh, like uh, the, like prioritizing uh, uh, this um, efforts to give long-term and stable access to these digitized resources to researchers. Um, openness is pretty obvious, I think. Uh, I could quote here the as open as possible, as close as necessary, famous axiom. And finally, uh, like uh, stewardship has to do with uh, provenance information, like, like the importance of being able to track rich documentation and provenance information on both sides as precisely as possible, which in a culture setting means um, provenance metadata, and on the researcher side means a rich documentation of how the derived data had been processed, had been cooked uh, uh, during the project's uh, lifetime. So these principles may sound, first of all, very high level, second of all, quite obvious to probably all of you, but believe me, it was a big, uh, it, it was quite serious uh, agreement and sometimes even negotiating work behind them um, um, by the um, organizations uh, behind these six principles. And then it was also rewarding because um, we got quite a huge um, endorsement from both cultural heritage profession, professional communities and from uh, arts and humanities, scholarly communities um, to these principles. Um, 
And I think it's also important to highlight, if you think about it, these are completely um, interoperable with the famous FAIR principles and um, probably even uh, their younger sisters, the CARE principles, but uh, they come with a special flavor that is tailor-made to the specific types of exchanges. So as I told, we received a lot of um, endorsement to the principles, but of course the big question was, okay, these are very high level ones, how one uh, could put them to practice? So to this direction, um, as a kind of a second step in the implementation of the state use charter, uh, Lauren Romery, uh, Dorian Sely, and me um, took a little exercise, took these um, six core principles of the data use charter, and we were trying to translate them into everyday, uh, like uh, still schematic, but everyday, like prototypical uh, workflows of cultural institutions, researchers, and data centers, respectively. And we came up like the result of this exercise is um, kind of a survey uh, in which um, in which all parties can ask, can answer a set of questions. You can see here an example for citability. For instance, uh, we ask cultural heritage institutions what's the data model for preferred citation standards. Uh, we also research teams. Um, how they want to acknowledge the many contributor goals to the research team and the like. So in the case of each principles, there is a set of questions to each players uh, who are relevant in the data exchange, and they can just um, answer these questions in order to uh, make the handshake between each other in order to make the transaction uh, viable. Um, so in practice, um, <coughs> it's one, advantage or perceived advantage of the data use charter is that it can be implemented in um, very flexibly, uh, like there are no infrastructure kind of restrictions on its implementation. Um, cultural heritage institution can uh, publish the principles and can detail, make their practical commitments to them explicit on their website. And of course, they also have the possibility to translate uh, in their data exchange protocols, for instance, if they have a site as metadata field uh, that uh, they can make available through the APIs or whatever exchange mechanism they have. Um, on the other hand, researchers are also encouraged to, um, to take this questionnaire, take this survey before they start their project, before they've started their either digital or physical exchanges to the archive or library or museum they are working with um, and uh, get the agreement, the reuse agreements uh, while um, figuring out all these details in partnership with the cultural heritage institution. Um, now that research data management plans and, and closing DMPs to um, research projects is getting more and more community practice, um, we propagate the use of this uh, survey to be to serve as a starting point for research data management plans where uh, access to cultural heritage data is uh, a cornerstone issue. So um, to finish my presentation, let me show you a couple of um, research contexts in which uh, we already implemented certain elements uh, of uh, this cultural heritage data use charter. So let me start with probably the most obvious one that uh, I just mentioned to you before, uh, in closing um, this reuse agreement in uh, a data management plan. Um, so we have this, exactly this is what we did with um, um, relatively young uh, Horizon 2020 project called the Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure Project, in which um, we're building a shared and sustainable infrastructure for literary studies. We upscale digitized um, uh, literary corpora for large-scale computational analysis. And um, we included the data reuse charter um, in the data management plan. Um, it will help us to access reuse rights to like to establish reuse rights to um, the digitized corpora we are aiming to uh, reuse in the project in an ethical 
and legal manner, also for uh, corpora that are not public domain but in copyright. So we can this uh, survey tool can uh, help us to tailor made the deals with the different um, provider digital uh, digitized literary corpora across Europe. The second use case uh, is a little bit exotic, I would say. It's uh, not coming from the scope of uh, cultural heritage, but digital humanities training. So at Daria, we wanted to pilot the data reuse charter also um, in the context of infrastructure, infrastructure governance. And um, we wanted to make our commitments to open and fair research culture, explicit uh, when it comes to Daria central infrastructure. So what we did is that we took the six core principles of this data reuse charter and we checked how they money, how these principles manifest in the everyday workflows associated with our training platform that is called Daria Campus. And so under the Daria Campus reuse charter, we make explicit how we uh, broker the exchanges with the providers of the training materials. Under openness, we make our licensing policies explicit. Um, under trustworthiness, we, um, we uh, describe our long-term archiving strategy and our, our stewardship. Uh, we um, talk about provenance information and how we accredit the many contributions many types of contributions to the platform. So you can uh, check out the links later on. I forgot to tell you all the work, all the publication, all the papers that I referred to in my talk will be referenced um, on my last slide so you can trace it back because provenance, you know. Um, <laughs> okay, and also you may know that um, establishing quality assessment frameworks around the types of research outputs that are not necessarily research papers or books, so not the usual types or usual suspects for peer review is really a big challenge in the transition to the open research culture. So we took the data reuse charter six principles and also in another project and these six principles serve the basis of um, the quality assessment framework specifically designed to the assessment of lexicographical data sets. Excuse me, some sort of a conference. <laughs> it's not me, I promise. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this work had been uh, realized within another European project called uh, Alexis, and I'm going to share the link to this um, assessment framework as well. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'm incredibly proudly presenting uh, the Croatian translation of uh, this aforementioned uh, reuse agreement template uh, between uh, the involved parties in cultural heritage exchange. Uh, this had been uh, created, translated, and very, very, very beautifully visualized by Karajka and, and, and her colleagues uh, at the Institute of Ethnology and Photo Research. And I think, Karajka, I can, I can tell this, that like our shared hope in this respect, that this kind of first step can pave the way of um, seeking opportunities to implement the data use charter also as a um, practice of institutional level um, exchange protocols. So I think it's worth to zoom out a little bit to finish. Um, don't forget that this is the big vision that we are aiming to tackle with the Culture Heritage Data Reuse Charter. This is the kind of continuum that we aim to facilitate by um, providing opportunities for each party to express their preferences, to express um, the challenges they're faced, to express the conditions of uh, access in this very specific research scenarios. So this is the big vision to realign this natural continuum of data curation to the silo working conditions of cultural heritage professionals and arts and humanities scholars. Um, 
course, the data use charter is not a holy grail. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's um, still a long way to go in its implementation. Uh, it's still, if you uh, think about the implementation scenarios that I uh, very briefly uh, touched upon in the past minutes, it's um, clear that uh, we haven't yet done any infrastructure heavy investment in this direction in the sense of infrastructure in strict sense but we were rather trying to accommodate um, the charter and the survey and this facilitator of the handshake in a range of different uh, research um, scenarios who are working with very different technical and data infrastructures so one advantage of the charter is that it can flexibly be done Another advantage is that um, compared to established legal frameworks like GDPR and like and the like, um, the data use charter allow us to accommodate a richer, um, a wider range of ethical considerations and practical considerations that are important, that could be important deal breakers of this uh, exchanges around cultural heritage. Um, it's interoperable with fair and care principles. Um, the big challenge that we are facing is, of course, scalability. So we piloted the charter so far in relatively small, on relatively small scale in very individual um, research infrastructure scenarios. And currently, uh, like we have a very promising starting uh, collaboration with Wikimedia Italy to explore ways to integrate the culture uh, heritage data use charter in larger scale, more computational um, systems like uh, Glam Wiki data, like the, the, the seeking um, opportunities for its implementation uh, within uh, Glam Wiki communities and in Wikidata uh, uh, working environments. Um, but I also have to be honest at this point and tell you how difficult it is to get um, funding framework around the cultural heritage data use charter because the silos, the institutional, legal, geographical silos that I mentioned at the beginning seem to be replicated in the funding framework, <laughs> funding landscape as well. And there are very, very few um, opportunities where uh, research institutions and GLAM institutions and data centers can apply uh, to research funding on equal terms. Those are very rare and precious opportunities, but hopefully in the near future, we will be able to, um, to um, acquire uh, something like that. Um, and of course, um, like if you like the idea of the culture heritage data use charter, if you see fantasy, if you have a potential use case in mind that you would like to um, like to um, pilot it, or you would just like to learn more about uh, the usage scenarios we have implemented so far, well, you know where to find me. And here you can find the publications as well. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, Shabet. That was a really articulate exposition of the charter. Um, I don't see any questions right now in the chat. So I think just to keep us on time, I'd like us to move ahead with the second presentation. And if we have time at the end, we can circle back. But I think you can put questions for Shabet in the chat as well. And uh, she can respond as we go as well, if that's OK. So our next speaker is Shang Yun Shen, and um, Shang Yun Shen works as a research specialist and communications manager at the Secretariat of the European Joint Programming Initiative on Cultural Heritage in the Fondation des Sciences du Patrimoine in France. And Shang Yun Shen is going to talk to us about the Joint Programming Initiative, Cultural Heritage and Global Change. I'll turn it over to you now. Yeah, thank you, Professor Anne, for your introduction. I hope everyone can he hear me well. I will share my screen now. 
Great. I hope everyone could see my presentation now. Great. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Professor M, as I just said, for your introduction. And thank you, Daria, Croatia, for your kind invitation. Actually, the GPSH always uh, looks for ways to collaborate with your network. So I'm very pleased today to share with you uh, the presentation about our initiative. So I will start with some context of what exactly is a GPI, because it's a rather kind of uh, confusing term. So in the 2008, facing with great challenges that no country can tackle alone, the European Commission introduced joint programming initiative as a new way to collaborate between countries. Joint programming initiative, or shortened as GPA, GPI, is a flexible intergovernmental process whose objective is to better align the research and the innovation investment and resources spent at national level. It strengthens the European research area and increase awareness of citizens, policymakers, and stakeholders within and beyond Europe. I hear from the previous presentation that uh, uh, there's always this kind of dismatch uh, when it comes to uh, transnational funding. So I hope maybe this GPI uh, initiative would be a good answer to that. So um, 10 GPIs has been established since then and uh, to cover major research fields in the European research landscape. And a quick uh, glance into all these 10 GPIs would review that uh, the GPI on cultural heritage and global changes is the only one that with a main focus on humanity. And uh, created by Italy and now coordinated by the French Ministry of Culture, we identify three major challenges that cultural heritage research has been facing. The first being climate change, second being the preservation, and the last, the use and transformational challenges of the cultural heritage. Um, currently, it's not really working. It doesn't go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, currently, the GPI Sage has 17 full members and two observers, and we always welcome any member state of the European Union, associated country to the European Framework uh, Program, or third country to join the initiative. So when France took the coordination of the initiative, a new form of governance was introduced. The GPSH now is directed by a governing board, as you could see here, made up by representatives from all member countries and advised by an advisor and scientific board. Our pillars and task forces carries out uh, activities within different intervention axes. So these axes are first strategic planning, second programming, third funding, and then the communication networking, the last policy making and prospecting. So for the strategic planning in 2020, we updated our strategic research and innovation agenda that could better reflect the political, economic, sociocultural, and technological changes in recent years. This document identifies seven underlying principles for the cultural heritage research. Uh, this underlying principles reaffirm that the initiative promotes a holistic approach to cultural heritage and encourages collaborative, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, innovative, basic and applied research to meet societal ch challenges and contribute to sustainable development. Public participation and engagement should be at the heart of our joint activities and education training opportunities should be developed. So to the interest of this conference, I want to highlight two of the principles, the holistic approach and digital. Here in GPICH, we embrace a holistic uh, definition of the cultural heritage. Not only does it imply the tangible and the intangible aspects, this very uh, traditional duality of the cultural heritage, but also the digital form of a cultural heritage, which could be texts, databases, images, audio, software, web pages, etc. Some of this digital heritage is created from the scanning or converting of physical objects that already exist, or some are 
created digitally or born digital. And for the digital principle, our agenda 2020 aims to ensure that the GPI Sage supports digital innovation within the heritage sector and contributes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For example, the SDG 20, uh, which aims to reduce inequality in digital ages. With this underlying research principles, uh, our updated agenda identifies four priority research areas. These are the first, a reflective heritage for a resilient society. Second, sustainable management of cultural heritage. Third, cultural heritage in a changing context. And the last one, cultural heritage facing climate and environmental change. And uh, already in our uh, old agenda published in the 2014, we have raised the questions like who own the digital form of cultural heritage and who decides who can create, access and use it, how can it be protected from cop uh, copyright infringement or how is intellectual property assigned in a digital world. Uh, so this concern of cultural heritage in the digital age is only strengthened in our new agenda. For example, here you could see in priority area one, theme two, cultural heritage for inclusion. Uh, we encourage the research to explore the contribution of digital application to the well beings of citizens and avoid the loss of memory within societies. And then in the priority area two, theme three, there is a whole sub theme dedicated to the topic. This theme addresses the unprecedented opportunities and challenges provided by digital technology and artificial intelligence for cultural heritage, including conservation, restoration, and management, engaging new users, and developing creative and accessible content. It builds on the increasing policy coordination on and research into the use and value of digital cultural heritage, including digital literacy and participation. It raises a question such as how can emerging technology uh, con connect new audience within, with heritage and what is the need to integrate, scale up and enable capacity building within the heritage sector? How do this new form of digital access lead to the inclusion and even exclusion of different groups? So you could say that here in GPSH, we recognize digital change as a main shift in the cultural heritage research landscape. And indeed, the word digital itself appears 42 times in our new strategic research and innovation agenda. Under the guidance of the vision, the agenda, etc., the GPSH over the years has successfully funded uh, a launch six transnational costs, 29 million euro enabled the funding of 55 projects in various disciplines. And for this conference, I want to draw your attention especially to this uh, call that we have launched in 2017, which is entitled Digital Heritage Joint Call. Uh, the call covers three basic topics, first being engagement with digital heritage, second commun communities and digital heritage, and last one safeguarding this digital heritage. Eight projects were selected for this funding. And in fact, last year, 2020, was the midterm of these projects. So the GPSH, together with the French National Research Agency, RNR, organized a two-day seminar for the scientific exchange on the current challenges of the digitalization of heritage and exploration of new possibilities offered by digital tools for the production and dissemination of knowledge. In this conference, uh, 450 participants, including 50 experts, project leaders have participated. And if you're interested in the discussion, want to find more about these projects funded by GPSH, you can watch the replay of the seminar on Heritage Research Hub. Here is the link, uh, which will also be the next point of my presentation. So aside from making strategic roadmaps, launching transnational calls, organizing seminars, et cetera, communication is another very important act for the GPSCH. And one of its outcome is the creation of the Heritage Research Hub. The hub is an online platform 
uh, where everyone could share and search for news, events, documents, funding, training, vacancies, and so many more about the cultural heritage research and get, basically get connected to the rest of the community. All this being said, I feel the best way to introduce to you our Heritage Research Hub is through a little virtual tour on it. So if you permit, here we go. Uh, I hope you can also see my uh, internet uh, browser. Okay, so here we are on the homepage. And uh, as it's written here, welcome to the Heritage Research Hub. So on the homepage, you have thumbnails about uh, news and then ongoing cost fundings on the cultural heritage uh, research. We made it very visual with this uh, time bar to kind of uh, pressurize the uh, researchers to catch up with the deadlines. And then you have the events and of course, uh, the first uh, Daria Croatia International Conference Digital Humanities and Heritage is already uh, announced on our website. And then when you go down, this is the my personal favorite part about uh, our website, which is the Heritage Projects section. If you click here to show all the projects, which leads you to this online archive that we're aiming to create to kind of gather as many as uh, cultural heritage research projects. Uh, up to today, actually, we already have 72 projects archived in on our hub. And with, as you can see, with this uh, tags and the uh, filter system, it's very easy for the researchers, the users to kind of triangulate uh, themselves within this massive landscape of cultural heritage research. Uh, for example, if uh, this project at Atlas, catches my eye, I can just click to go to its uh, presentation page where I can find basic facts about the project, uh, who funded, who are the consortium, and then the presentation about the project. And then of course, the expected impacts and results about the projects. So it's a very useful online tool and I hope really would facilitate the cultural heritage projects leaders. And then going back to the navigation bar, uh, we also have here the GPI CH section, uh, which will give you more information about the organization. Basically, it's the repetition of what I have just presented. And if anything is not clear, which I hope is not the case, anyway, you could always go there to find more about our initiative. And then there is also the heritage community section. This is still an ongoing um, endeavor that we wanted to gather all the organizations, agencies, institute that working on the cultural heritage research. Also, we want to give people like very short glances into the national strategies and policies about cultural heritage in each different European countries. And then, this section already kind of introduced it already. It's the where you can keep yourself basically posted of what's going on in the cultural heritage research community. So here, for example, in the subsection of the fundings, not only we have uh, announced, for example, the European, uh, the Horizon Europe destination on cultural heritage, we also actually handpicked several other costs in other clusters that has indirect links to the cultural heritage research. For example, this one, it's in the cluster one uh, with the, a, a theme of health, but then one of the topic mentions about building materials, then it's a very easy link back to the cultural heritage research. So we really hope all this uh, contents would really help the cultural heritage researchers to aiming uh, more and aiming bigger for their cultural heritage research. And also uh, we notice sometimes, for example, uh, for small uh, research projects, it's really hard for them to find uh, partners. So we help, with, uh, we help anyone with the need to uh, publish their call for partnerships, 
our hub. So for example, here it's Austrian Film Museum. They're looking for partners for collaborative research and, call, uh, and apply for fundings. So it's really a uh, very um, useful platform built for the cultural heritage research community. And everyone, um, if you have need to really uh, with your cultural heritage research project, you know now where to go and where to resort to. This is the heritage research hub that we built for you. And uh, back to my presentation, basically, uh, as I said, if you need a shout out of your organization or your project, uh, just sign up and DIY your own post now on the hub. And also we have social media accounts, heritage research hub on uh, Twitter and as well as on Facebook. So uh, that's basically my presentation about the GPSH and the Heritage Research Hub. And if you know, want to know more, now you know where to go. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Xiang Yong, Xie Xie. Um, That was another extremely clear presentation and I think it fit very nicely with our first presentation as well. Um, we do have a few minutes if anybody has a question you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand if, you, if we can see you on the screen. Um, I didn't see anything so far in the chat. If we don't have anything right now, I think um, what we will do is we will move on to our third presentation today. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat while the speakers are speaking. Um, or um, when we um, come back to the screen, we, you can raise your hand and we can, um, you can speak then. So we have two speakers for our final presentation. Um, Cécile Chantraine Brayon, who is a professor of Hispanic studies at La Rochelle University and whose research focuses on Hispanic American theater and performing arts. And Laurence delbar Willard, who is an engineer in instrumentation and experimental techniques at the Scalab Research Laboratory and technical manager at, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I think, Equipex, Irdiv. I don't know. Um, so I, they are going to be presenting today on playing in a traditional venue versus playing in a non-traditional venue, measuring performance. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and the presentation. Uh, um, and uh, we are really pleased uh, to be here uh, with you all and uh, thanks a lot for um, to the organizers. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, um, okay. I'm not, oh, I'm not sure. It's okay now, you can continue. Ah, can, you see, can you see my screen? Yes? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay, now I can. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you, give, you hadn't given me the rights. Um, okay, so our presentation uh, is um, called Playing in a Traditional Venue versus Playing in a Non-Traditional Venue, Measuring Performance. So uh, with this title, uh, you might understand that uh, we are going to talk um, about uh, performing arts and more, precise, more precisely about uh, the digitization of the research uh, in performing arts. And um, in concrete terms, we are going to present you a study uh, we've been uh, carrying out. Uh, it's a, a, an experiment uh, we did um, to uh, know uh, if uh, the performance space, uh, that is to say the space where the actors uh, do their performance, uh, has an impact in their interpretation or not. 
So what we did, um, um, it was in November uh, 2015, um, so about two years ago, uh, we decided to compare uh, the, the interpretation of uh, the same scene um, of a play, uh, uh, the same scene uh, uh, played, uh, performed in a traditional venue, that is to say a, a theater hall, and um, uh, in a non-conventional uh, venue, uh, that is to say another place than a theater hall, and uh, uh, more uh, particularly uh, in a laboratory. <laughs> In a, uh, uh, in a laboratory in a university. Um, so uh, we used uh, to uh, measure, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea was um, uh, not to study all uh, the interpretation of uh, the actors because it would have been very complicated. What we decided to analyze is uh, the movement of uh, the, uh, the actors. And that's why we used uh, an equipment uh, which is called a motion capture, a motion capture equipment. Um, as I said, uh, this experiment uh, integrates uh, the performance um, studies and uh, what we want uh, to um, uh, study really in this case is uh, uh, to know uh, what is really uh, performative in uh, performing arts, uh, what makes uh, performing arts really uh, different uh, from uh, mimetic arts, for instance, and uh, our study um, enters into, into what we call uh, the digital, uh, the, perf the performative term, uh, which is a, a theoretical uh, slippage between between the theatrical studies, um, from the theatrical studies to uh, the performing, uh, the performance studies. Uh, and uh, it is uh, today um, helped by the digital revolution and all uh, the digital uh, material we have to study uh, theater, dance, or, or uh, also uh, music, for instance. Uh, so we've got now different uh, possibility to study performing arts, and uh, we call it, uh, now we can say that we work in performance studies, but we also say that we are making theatrology, uh, as it is called by um, one of my colleague and critical Patrice Pavis. Um, so, um, um, my colleague Laurence will talk about the visual staging um, experience. Okay, and uh, in this case, um, okay, I am active. Um, how the space, space where the, the heart of an artist influences our play. play and their way of performing? And uh, the visual staging experiment uh, consists in studying the kinematics of the actor. And for that, the data re was recorded uh, with the Qualysis uh, motion capture system. Five uh, synchronized cameras were placed around the measurement scene, uh, scene controlled by a server. And the operating principle is that each of the camera is composed of an infrared transmitter and receiver and only detects the reflection of its own synchronized flashes on the marker fitted to the actor. Um, the space we have uh, for the space, we have asked the actors to respect the performance space, five meter square side area in the art room in, uh, in lab, uh, Saldar. We can see on the screen below um, the, the, this, uh, square, this square, the play, the play space. And uh, in the theater, the, hero, the area was limited by spotlights beam. Oh, 
uh, during this experiment, we have uh, com different constraints. In the theater, all the instability of the theater fly balls uh, suspended above the stage. Um, it was uh, one constraint. Uh, the placement of the camera uh, was, um, was very important because uh, each camera, uh, each marker, pardon, each marker must be seen by at least three cameras. Is the reason for what? Two cameras was on tripods, were set on the back on the stage uh, in, in the theater. One camera on the garden side and two cameras were hung on either side on the stage at the balcony. In the laboratory, cameras had to be hung from the grill to optimum, optimize the space. And we have uh, uh, time limited and the number of tries limited too. Um, we can see here the visualization of view cones in both the new, in laboratory and in the theater. Uh, in the theater of, uh, on the right of the, of this slide and uh, the, the position of camera and you, we can see the view cone uh, in, the, in the heart laboratory on the left. The start uh, the start uh, experiment was um, to, to define a calibration, uh, it's a calibration step. It means that we have to define the reference to locate the position of the markers. O, uh, X, Y, Z axis uh, is a reflection, reference uh, with uh, the center O and the X, U and Z axis in which the coordinates of the marker will be expressed. Okay, um, sorry, we've got to uh, switch off the sound <laughs> from each other, so it's a, a little bit complicated, but it's fine. Um, so, um, oops, sorry for that. Um, what we realized, um, analyzing uh, all uh, the data uh, we, we had after the experience, is that uh, space and audience, uh, so spectators, are uh, the principal constraints uh, on the interpretation of uh, the actors. So we will start with the role of the size of the space, telling you first that uh, there were Actually, uh, the space was configured. The spaces were configured the same, but they were quite different in a way. So I will tell you that uh, why. So the first one, the conventional venue, uh, the theater hall, uh, located in the north of France, uh, it was um, a relatively open space um, with uh, boundaries for the actors, uh, where, uh, which was um, which were uh, indicated from spotlight beam on the floor. Uh, so they had their performance space clearly uh, indicated, and there were. Um, on the stage, no closed wall uh, framing this imposed space. There were uh, stage curtains uh, about one meter apart on the courtyard and garden sides, uh, and a back wall more than four meters away. Um, the space of the laboratory or salle d'art is more. Um, more closed in a way because it was truly embedded in the room. Um, you, uh, the actors had the proximity of two pillars and four walls. Uh, notably, uh, the left wall was located less than 40 centimeters from the actors playing area. Uh, um, furthermore, the, uh, the sailing, the lower sailing was at a height at three uh, meters 20, whereas the sailing of the stage uh, of uh, the conventional venue, uh, so the theater hall, reaches uh, seven meters. So uh, this had, uh, in a way, an impact on the speed of the movement, as will explain you, uh, Laurence.
We can see uh, on the on the graph below. Sorry, uh, we can see here the impact of the speed of movement of actors. Uh, on the graph uh, below, um, this we can see the x, y, and z components of actress position. X component is uh, is in blue. Um, I um, z z is the yellow and uh, uh, y, y component is represented in red. Uh, it is a projection of the of the, the position, uh, the projection on the i uh, axis. Let's remember oh, that the velocity is the variation of position divided by the variation of time. The actor moves faster in the conventional space while they hope for a slower gate in the transverse axis, y axis. And on the, you, you, you can see on the, the graphic already this uh, velocity and uh, when you have the superposition of y, um, position and velocity, uh, initial position of uh, Eurydice, you can see the evolution along the, the y axis in the system O, X, Y, and Z reference, uh, you can see in red uh, that the, the velocity uh, seems to be, uh, it's uh, quite uh, constant, but uh, we can see some oscillation. Uh, we can go on, uh, it would be perhaps uh, simpler, thank you. And uh, on this slide, uh, we have in this uh, context the Eurydice velocity in the theater, and uh, in red, represented in red in, on this uh, graphical representation, and uh, the velocity is uh, represented in blue in laboratory. Um, the oscillation are due to pendular oscillation of the walking. Uh, and if we are doing the, the average and the comparison uh, for the following, please, it's the, in the following, thank you. And uh, we can see in the in this case that uh, after after the half uh, the half turn, uh, the velocity in laboratory in theater, pardon, is higher than uh, twenty one percent. That velocity in laboratory, and uh, after the second half turn, the velocity in theater is higher um, twenty twenty percent. Uh, higher as, uh, than in laboratory. And after the third, the third half turn, in this case, the velocity in theater is 40% higher than in laboratory. Okay. Um, so, uh, when we are talking about half turn, uh, let, um, let me uh, precise that uh, we, what we analyzed uh, in uh, concrete terms was uh, the walking, uh, was a scene of the play, obviously, but that was the walking of two actors uh, playing uh, in a play uh, called um, uh, Orfeo. <laughs> in Spanish, and it was uh, the couple uh, er Eurydice and uh, Orpheus walking uh, out of uh, the underground world. So how can we interpret uh, this uh, difference of velocity uh, in, uh, on the stage? Uh, we try to understand that uh, in the light of two uh, theorists, uh, which are, uh, who are uh, Abraham Moles and uh, Elisabeth Romer. And what they say about the space uh, in theater is that uh, the th a theater hall is a confined place where a, a condensed representation of what would happen in the real universe, universe to which the theatrical work refers, is realized, uh, uh, is realized uh, and uh, the actors uh, transform it through expression. Uh, they call it expressive uh, transformation. 
indeed uh, the real representation of the action so the 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 way uh, they are walking going out of uh, the underground world cannot be realized or materialized on the stage due to the lake of space um, so uh, when we say that, we've got to, uh, to precise that uh, not all theater space, uh, that was our case, not all performance spaces have the same dimension. And therefore, uh, they don't have the same capital or special budgets that are the words used by Abraham Moles and Elizabeth Homer. And that's uh, the cases of the two places we have chosen for uh, the experiment. Uh, the art room space uh, seemed uh, to the actor obviously smaller than uh, the conventional venue. Uh, and you can see uh, in uh, this slide uh, that they didn't use uh, the in the same way uh, the space they had. And I leave uh, um, Laurence uh, talking about it. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. And um, we can see here the trajectory representation of the actress markers in the laboratory. It's a, a top view um, and the we can see that uh, in the laboratory, the, the evolution was in a rectangle of a three meter point uh, four uh, by uh, by uh, four point four meter in the condition of uh, laboratory. Uh, where are in the theater, the actor uh, moved in the, in the five meter side square. And uh, we, we can see, even if the, the space was, um, was delimited uh, in advance, the actor uh, use or not the space offered to them. Um, also, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, also, um, uh, Abraham Moles and Elizabeth Homer uh, state in this respect that um, uh, the individual or uh, uh, the person never gets too close to material obstacles uh, and um, it is uh, the case uh, in the laboratory, they had um, uh, four walls around them and quite close. In life, we never shake a brick wall and that in relation to the set, uh, the actor must maintain a margin of safety. This margin of safety occupies a certain surface of the stage, which is thereby deducted from the capital of space. I used an uh, expression I used before, at his disposal. Thus, uh, we uh, conclude that to signify, signify and interpret that they were traveling the same distance in both space, um, so the same distance uh, the character were uh, walking through, so the exit from the underworld, the actors had to opt for different speeds during their transverse movements, uh, depending on where they were. Faster in the space so that seemed larger for them on the theater hall or theater stage, and slower in the space that seemed smaller in the art room or laboratory. Um, another observation is uh, also uh, the amplitude of the actor's gestures. And I let uh, uh, um, Laurence talking. Um, the amplitude of the actor gesture is greater in the theater than in the laboratory. Variation in the height of the actor's wrist. Uh, if we average the variation in wrist height in the theater, we get 19.8 centimeter in the laboratory and 28.5 centimeter in the theater. According to the biomechanics, arm swing is a counterbalance of the reciprocating movement of the legs. The, thus, the faster 
on individual walks, the more he shapes his head and extends his upper limbs. Difference in, in amplitude of gesture is related to the speed of movement of uh, the movement he chooses according to the space where he performs. Larger gestures on the theater stage and smaller gestures in the art room in the theater and uh, smaller in lab. We can see on the left the variation of Orpheus wrist height in the laboratory and on stage. Um, and on the right, we can see the cumulative variation in the height variation of the marker placed on the actor right wrist. And uh, it, it's very, it's, oh, it, if it was not obvious on the um, graphical, on the left, we can, we can measure the, the differences very, important. Okay, so as an intermediate uh, conclusion, uh, we can see that um, the speed um, of, the, of movement and correlatively the amplitude of the actor's gestures are thus uh, representational or expressive acts that serve to signify to signify the space and distance that in the referent or real universe the characters are supposed to travel in order to emerge from the underworld as abraham mose and elizabeth romer point out it is from this behavioral expressivity of the actors that the spectator redilates the stage to the dimension of the real world, real because it's fictional, so but real, and that is uh, that is imagination comes to conceive the space of the inframon from which Orpheus and Eurydice seek uh, to escape. Um, the other uh, constraint uh, we saw uh, in uh, the performance uh, of the actors of the actors' performance uh, in relation with uh, the space was the role of uh, the the audience positioning, so where the spectators were located in both cases. Um, in the traditional venue, uh, so in the theater hall, um, the public or the spectators were classically installed in the Spain nose of the orchestra uh, in the second row, that is to say about two meters from the stage and about one meter, tw one twenty meter, uh, one meter twenty below the stage where the actors were playing. In the laboratory or Saldar, uh, it was a single level room, and so uh, the public was at the same height as the actor, except that the spectators uh, chose to sit on the floor about one, me one meter away from the playing area. Um, the first thing we noticed is that uh, the initial positioning of the audience uh, had an impact uh, on uh, the performance of the actor's performance. Well, I explain, I will explain why. Um, we, we did a, a first take of data a kind of rehearsal for the actors. And uh, during this first rehearsal in the laboratory, the audience was placed on either side of the performance space. As you can see um, on the scheme, uh, you will see that uh, the public was um, uh, on the left in a way, but during the real soul, uh, the, the public, the spectators also uh, placed him, uh, themselves uh, in the in where you've got the word screen. Uh, so he was in both sides of the performance space. And uh, that this location undoubtedly conditioned the actors as they started the scene after the real soul for. Uh, the second take of data. Um, for the second take of data, so for the data we are using now, they decided 
uh, to uh, play exactly the same. That is to say that they uh, used the same trajectory as uh, they did for the real soul. So they started uh, in front of one part of the public, of the audience, and they finished uh, the scene in front of the other part of the audience. That was something we thought that was quite interesting. So because we asked ourselves if it was uh, because the space was different. So maybe the first um, hypothesis is that uh, as they did the rehearsal like that, uh, they did the second um, take uh, for, um, uh, they did the second take the same. Uh, even if before they had um, performed uh, in the theater hall uh, in another way and finished uh, at the same um, at the same place as they had begin begin um, the other um, explanation we can uh, advance is uh, maybe because uh, in uh, the laboratory there were a screen, as you can see on the photo, uh, in uh, the back uh, of uh, the background of uh, the laboratory, and maybe we can uh, put that put this screen in relation uh, with uh, what Denis Diderot, the French philosopher, called the first the fourth wall in a theater hall that separates um, the, 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 the actors from uh, the public, the audience. And uh, this fourth wall is like the wall uh, you can't cross because there is the, the audience, uh, as an actor you can't cross because there is a public, uh, the audience in front of you. So maybe for them, this screen was the materialization of uh, the audience in a way. So, but we, we are not quite sure if we, we can explain it uh, with the first explanation uh, because of the real soul or because of the presence of the screen in the laboratory. Even, even, if, uh, the, even if the initial positions were the same in the both the news, the final positions uh, were different very different. Uh, the actor finished in front of public in the theater, but at the background. And uh, that we can see on the, on the graphical representation of the, on the right of the screen. Um, in the laboratory, uh, they are in front of the public, uh, where they are um, far from the public in laboratory. Uh, observation, the observation of the realization of the period uh, that the actress performed during, during the um, performance, uh, in effect, the actress made a half turn and uh, she, was, she, she has stopped her walking and uh, the, the period that she made uh, in, is slightly faster in the theater on the horizontal plane or x y plane the amplitude of the maximum speed of oh, this is uh, left elbow is uh, 341 centimeter per second in the theater and uh, 322 centimeter per second in the laboratory uh, what we can see in the in the graphic representation below uh, in, this means that the, in, the, in the theater, the speed of the period is therefore uh, five percent greater than in the heart room. Um, just uh, to precise, she, uh, the actress, did uh, a, a half turn because uh, the the other uh, actor, as Orpheus, uh, told her. But um, uh, she, no, she she they remember that he can't uh, watch her, so she stops and she does a half turn, as she doesn't want Orpheus to watch us, watch her. Uh, so how can we interpret that? 
Um, so uh, we thought that maybe uh, the audience's uh, positioning has uh, an, um, an impact uh, on the velocity of uh, this movement, this pirouette of uh, the actress. Indeed, uh, we read a book called Cours sur la perception du mouvement de Gilbert Simondon uh, that reminds us that the distance of an horizontally moving object decreases its apparent speed for the perceive. It's an optical um, uh, effect known as parallax. He says exactly if two identical objects move trans transversely at six meters, six meters and 20 meters from the subject, the speed of the second must be 1.6 times that of the first of them to appear equal. In our case, the one who perceived the movements was the, audi the audience in the theater, and the audience was located at least one extra meter away from the performance space compared to the art room. So for the audience in the theater, the actress was located one meter further away than in the laboratory. Um, Consequently, no, it's not in order. Thank you. In order to perform the operation in the heart room, room, the actress took into account the different positioning of the audience to compensate for this product effect. She performed a period slower on the horizontal plane than in the theater. However, as we can see on the graph on the right, the actress made a more pronounced movement in the laboratory just before performing the pirouette. She lowered her body by 34.7 centimeter, unlike in the theater where she lowered herself by 29.5 centimeter. The initial lowering in the heart room means that the speed of the pirouette, which she performs immediately afterwards is higher in the vertical plane z, z axis in the laboratory than in the theater 122 centimeters by per second and uh, because uh, and uh, 122 centimeters per second in the lab consequently all through the speed of the period measured on the horizontal plane or xy plane is higher in the theater as seen before its global speed uh, velocity xyz um, is in fact the same in the theater and in the heart room it only differs by one percent which is imperceptible to the spectator in fact the global speed v in the theater of 350 Pardon, 357 centimeters per second is almost the same as in the laboratory, which is 354 centimeters per, per second. Uh, so the final interpretation of uh, the difference uh, of speed uh, in uh, uh, of the pirouette um, did by the actress in the horizontal. Uh, plan. Uh, uh, so is that um, uh, maybe uh, in the art room, the actress distributed probably unconsciously the speed of her pirouette differently insofar as she would have perceived that the audience was closer to her than in the theater hall. In concrete terms, she reduced her speed, uh, her speed <laughs> in the horizontal, horizontal plane to compensate for the parallax effect mentioned before while transferring the differential to the vertical plane. This adaptation thus allowed the overall, spe the overall speed of the pirouette to be almost the same in the theater hall as in the art room. And we go now uh, to our conclusion. 
Um, so uh, we realized after the experience, the, the experiment that the actors adapt their acting, the acting, the acting, sorry, in terms of movement and motion according to where they are performing. This adaptation was constrained by a different perception of the performance space, which was nevertheless calibrated in the same way for the experiment. The actors obviously adjusted the speed of their movements and the amplitude of their gestures in each place to signify that despite everything, the characters they were playing were evolving in a space of identical dimensions. The, lo the location of the audience also seemed to play a role in their act in both spaces. In particular, the location of the spectators, who were a little further away in the theatre hall than in the art room, probably forced the actress to adapt the, the speed of some of her movements due to a possible parallax effect in the spectator. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Uh, merci beaucoup, Cécile et Laurence. Uh, thank you very much for a, a really fascinating presentation. Uh, in my own field of archival studies, I can see some really interesting implications for, for um, archiving contemporary theatre productions and perhaps for some new forms of analysis of historical productions too, depending on what data we have. Um, we are, I think, uh, almost out of time here. Um, we have one question from Drahamira um, Cooper um, on a question for Cécile and Laurence, um, whether interviews conducted with the actors before or after the experiment in order to find out their perception of the differences of performance observed in the theater and in the art room. Um, hi, uh, Drahamira. <laughs> really pleased uh, with your question. Um, actually, no, uh, but that was um, a, a decision we made, um, 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 both of us, uh, Laurence, uh, because we didn't want, uh, we didn't uh, make um, the interview before because we didn't want to, we didn't want to be uh, influenced by uh, what they would have said. Uh, we wanted to be completely free from what um, they would have thought or felt. So um, we, we, we decided not to interview them. Uh, and um, after the experiment, we also decided not to have their perception. That, not, that doesn't mean that we were not interested, but we thought that it was better to feel completely um, free and not to have a confirmation because uh, we, were not you, we were not sure how to use uh, those interviews. Because for instance, if they would have told us, uh, we uh, have, we, we, for, for instance, in the laboratory, if they would have told us, we uh, finished uh, the performance uh, on the other side uh, of the performance space. Um, because of what we did during the rehearsal, I'm not sure uh, we would have feel, um, we would ha have felt allowed to interpret it on the other way with um, the hypothesis of the, the screen. But I'm completely right with the idea that we must try to go further with this experience, to do it again, and maybe uh, interviewing the actors. Also, we could uh, work about um, uh, the, um, the way they were saying their text, if maybe the space has an impact of the velocity, uh, how they are um, telling their text. So we've got a lot of ideas about uh, going uh, further in this uh, experiment. I think you're, you're right, I'm going to. Yes. So thank you both very much. We are out of time for this session. I would like to thank all of the speakers today for um, really excellent presentations um, 
And uh, thank you to the audience in Zada. Um, Fala, a good Virginia. Thank <laughs> you.